Let's talk about Crown Jewel. We're also going to talk about SmackDown and some news and notes, but uh, we're going to sprinkle all that stuff together. The main course is Crown Jewel. We will be using that to tell the rest of the story. What we don't get from Crown Jewel, we will fill in with SmackDown. And then if there's any other news and notes, we will bring it in. So we got a big return for some people. Um, I will pontificate about whether I think it's a big return or not. I'm pretty sure you think you have a pretty good idea what I think. But let's get into Crown Jewel. I did not watch the pre-show because I forgot there was a pre-show, but I'm pretty sure Sami Zayn beat J.D. McDonough. Well, that all is right with the world. First, the World Heavyweight Championship match. Seth Rollins versus Drew McIntyre. A solid match with no heat. Uh, that was the problem. The fans were very, very much behind Drew McIntyre. They were hot for this. They were behind Drew. The idea, the story going into this match is who had sold out to Judgment Day. And uh, both had been seen talking to Rhea Ripley. Then when all came down to it, it was Babyface versus Babyface. And Rhea Ripley and the Judgment Day played no role in this match. So what was all that for? They just dropped it. He had Rhea Ripley send a t uh, tweet saying, wishing both guys luck. But that was it. Uh, no threats. No, you know, tease. How it went at SummerSlam 92 between Savage and Warrior is that uh, both Ric Flair and Mr. Perfect came down ringside and caused chaos. Kind of helping both guys to give the fans the idea that this guy sold out. And then they would help the other one. They'd be like, oh, no, no, he was the one who really sold out. And then it would be a disqualification, you know, which I could have done without the disqualification part. I think it was a count out, actually. We could have done without that part, but there needed to be some heat in this match. Somebody needed to be the bad guy here. And since neither one of them was the bad guy, I had a difficult time really getting into it. Um, it was a good match, though. I'm not going to say it was terrible, but I was just kind of like, oh, it's a little long in the tooth for a match with no heat. Um, Seth Rollins wins with the pedigree plus the stomp. It just seems like we're going to double up finishers. That's that King's Road, um, new, what was that, Pro Wrestling Noah, where we hit each other with huge moves back to back. I don't like it. I, I honestly don't like it. It makes the finishes too flat. If you if he'd hit the pedigree and pinned him and left some fight in Drew, we would have had a good um, idea for a rematch. If there was some type of situation in which Drew caught the stump and it was accidental or whatever, then it probably would have left some fight in Drew and we could have had you know, an idea for a rematch. But if you get knocked unconscious, basically picked up and then knocked unconscious again, or double unconscious, then you just lost pretty damn flat. And that's become a, one of the two things I'm really kind of tired of in wrestling in general. But I wish WWE had not picked it up. Since they have, it's not been good. Uh, of course, Drew McIntyre targeted the back the whole night. Um, means nothing because Seth Rollins doesn't really sell his back. He was doing a Phoenix Splash not too long afterwards. Also, uh, I saw this on Twitter, and it's something that I think should have been mentioned. Uh, do you all remember when Seth Rollins tore like his MCL, ACL, meniscus, just tore everything up in his knee? Shouldn't that be a part of this story, too? Like, yeah, he's got like this long-standing back injury, but he's also got like a completely reconstructed leg. And that should be something that probably people target as well. Um, I think they've just gone on Shawn Michaels. They're going to target his back. I'm okay with Seth winning, even though I think Drew should have won. I'm all right with Seth winning because it seems like they really are about to do something with Drew now. That being said, apparently Drew McIntyre has not signed his new contract. And uh, I think there's six months left on the current deal that breaks after, or ends after WrestleMania. And uh, that would explain probably his booking. But I guess they're still in negotiations. Uh, it ain't, I don't know if it's looking good or not, but he's on TV. Keep chugging along, I guess. But um, what do you do with Drew McIntyre now? I mean, he's got to turn heel, like thoroughly turn heel now, right? Like, you really don't have any other option. You can't keep playing the, the tweener role or... 
him being dour, he's been he's coming like Bret Hart in '96 now, where he's uh, he's bitching and moaning and whining and crying a lot, and that's going to end up turning him heel. But Drew McIntyre is a huge man; he shouldn't be in that role. He shouldn't be the guy whining and crying and woe is me. He should be, you know, with a harder edge. The guy carries a sword to the ring. It should be a harder edge to Drew McIntyre than there is. And uh, the, the old WWF knew how to, you know, produce a guy like this. The only judgment day we get is at the end of the match where Damian Priest comes to the ring with the Money in the Bank briefcase. He's going to cash it in after Seth Rollins won. Seth Rollins is still standing. He's not, like, dead or anything. Um, as Damian Priest is telling the referee he's going to cash in the Money in the Bank briefcase, Sami Zayn jumps out of the dark, attacks Damian Priest, steals the briefcase, and runs. Now, I actually like that. I thought that was good. Because the, the fiery promo that Sami Zayn cut on Monday was all about... Hey, I'm going to stop Judgment Day from gaining any more power. And one of the ways he can stop them from gaining any more power is preventing Damian Priest from becoming the world champion. Perfect. And since Damian Priest cannot uh, uh, cash in the money in the bank briefcase because he's not in possession of it, that gives them the impetus to chase Sami Zayn. Now, I know I'm sick and everybody's sick of Sami Zayn versus the Judgment Day. Everybody's tired of that but now they have a reason to keep it going because now the judgment day are going to try to retrieve the money in the bank briefcase now hopefully they don't do anything stupid like what uh aew just did where Sami Zayn's like oh you want this briefcase you got to beat me up for it um <laughs> which they which it seems like that's what they're going to do i i hope not after the match, Rhea Ripley also saw Drew McIntyre backstage and just looked at him like, poor Drew, look at you, sad, ain't you? Like I said before, you know, Drew McIntyre being treated like Charlie Brown. I mean, come on, stop it. This dude's a monster. Do something else. All right, the next match was the Fatal Five Way for the women's title. Rhea Ripley, Zoe Stark, Shayna Baszler, Nia Jax, Raquel Rodriguez. Raquel Rodriguez, man, her brain has got to be small. She tried to do her back uh, flexing thing, but she's wearing a cat suit. It's Saudi Arabia. <laughs> she's like, look at my back. He's like, yes, it's covered. You dress like a Power Ranger. Nobody can see your well-definition back. Um, very weird. Uh, Rhea Ripley's entrance featured like 42 Saudi men holding cups of viscous liquid that smokes. I don't know what the hell was going on. I, of course, was very confused. I was like, why are all these guys here? What do all these guys want? I thought their cups were going to be like on fire or they were going to, you know, do something. They didn't do anything. They just stood there. And uh, somebody told me on Twitter that it was a sign of respect for Rhea Ripley to stand amongst the men. And that was sort of a cultural thing to allow a woman to stand amongst the men. And so when Rhea Ripley was standing there with all of these men, they didn't have to do anything. Just her symbolically standing amongst men put her on equal footing with the men. And that's a big, important thing in Saudi culture, apparently. And uh, I didn't think of it that way because I have a Western brain. I don't have a Middle Eastern brain. So uh, very impressive, I guess. <laughs> I don't. I don't know, but uh, I, I think some of my anti-feminist followers and listeners will be like, Rah! I'm just kind of like shrug, you know, I, I guess she don't have to be there, but twice a year. So <laughs> she only got to be there twice a year. Uh, this match was a bit of a snoozer. I didn't really care about this. This was another match with no heat. I mean, there's four people I don't like. I don't care about Shayna Baszler. I don't care about Ra Raquel Rodriguez anymore. Zoe Stark, how can you care? She's trying very hard, but Kermit the Frog is just not going to get over. Zoe Stark is one of Triple H's favorites, apparently. She's just not going to get over, all right? It's just ain't not. She talks like she's got a mouthpiece in. I don't get it. Don't understand it. Of course, Rhea Ripley wins the match. She uh, rip tied. I'm not sure who was on top of who. And they were stacked all on top of each other, all right? I'm... Raquel Rodriguez is there. Shayna Baszler was on the bottom of the stack because she got pinned. And that was it. 
So, of course, uh, Rhea Ripley won. That match was probably, probably the most predictable of all the matches on the show. Without question. Next, now we finally get to move over to SmackDown. Because John Cena versus Solo Sikoa was the next match. So, on SmackDown, they did the face-to-face. Paul Heyman said this is the end of days for John Cena. But this is not what he wanted. Uh, John Cena came back and picked a fight with the bloodline. And what Roman did is Roman does what he always does. He called the shot. But he didn't just call any shot. He called in the assassin of the bloodline. The Samoan assassin. They should just basically go with that as a nickname for Solo Sokoa. That rules. The Solo, the Samoan assassin. Solo then took the microphone and said that Paul Heyman is wasting his breath talking to the people. And that he came to talk to John Cena. And he says that he, uh, so John Cena comes out. He says that he's pissed. He's got to wait till tomorrow to fight John Cena. But Roman gave him the order to let John Cena say goodbye. So Cena then perpetrates an absolute assault on Solo Sokoa by saying, we waited two years for you to talk and this is all you got. Says he's not going to say goodbye to the people. He's going to say goodbye for the people. He then said the only reason Solo Sokoa is standing there is because of his cousins. It's the only reason he's got a job. Then he called him a Taz ripoff. And I was like, oh my God. And he did all of this with a shot voice. That was not very good. Um, the promo was great. I mean, he absolutely tore into Solo Sokoa. And Solo was forced to stand there and take it. But uh, I was like, geez. You know, it was pretty good acting to, for him to have the, you know, the voice all raspy and everything. That was great. That was a good touch. And they were selling the Samoan Spike, which was a great touch. So Solo goes out there. He speaks, but he doesn't say much. And Cena steamrolls him in the promo. Just the new John Cena basically just comes out there, tells the new guy they suck. You're not good enough. You're the shits. You're not, you know, like, he just comes out hard berries and then loses. I'm like, damn. <laughs> just, like he came out after that promo, after the one on Friday. I kind of changed my mind. I was like, okay, maybe Solo does need to win. <laughs> you know, like, like uh, everybody's going to think he ain't shit if John Cena just basically says you're only here because of your cousins and you're a rip off of Taz and, you know. I'm like, wow, you're going stick to your, stick your thumb up your own ass? I'm like, sheesh. Cena? T- take a break. <laughs> you know, you get a guy some slack. All right, so that brings us to the match itself on uh, Crown Jewel. Where Solo Sokoa defeats John Cena clean, mind you, with like two dozen Samoan spikes. The crowd was melting for Cena. Everybody loved Cena. The crowd was singing his theme song to start the show. Just, you know, huge. Huge for Cena. Cena actually did well in this match. He actually worked, unlike the the theory match, which I think he didn't give a shit. He actually seemed to care about this one. And, uh... Did some really good stuff. He even choke slammed Solo Sokoa in this match at this at one point in this match, which is very impressive. But uh Solo Sokoa hit a series of Samoan spikes, um, including like three or four once Cena was already down on the ground and pinned John Cena clean. And uh the air left the building. Uh it was difficult. The show was hard after this, man. <laughs> This show got difficult after this one because the crowd was like, all the heat was taken out of the building and they just let it all out. Cena got a standing ovation after the match. Uh, a lot of people talked about this being the end for John Cena. A uh, big win for Solo Sokoa. Huge win. Now there has been, I saw some debate. Some people saying that, hey, you know, Solo beating John Cena would matter more if the story wasn't, ah, Cena ain't won a singles match in five years. That if Cena was super Cena and beat Solo, and, you know, Solo Sokoa beat him, that would be more impressive. And I, there is no doubt about it. That is true. If, if it was super Cena, yes, it would have been more impressive. But since it's, you know, movie star John Cena, mm, it's still impressive because it's still John Cena. 
he ain't quite gotten to, you know, you re you beating up Ric Flair in 2010 or, you know, 2008 or anything like that. Ain't gotten that bad yet. But I do think that there is some level of Cena is washed. He ain't the Cena of old. But it's still a pretty big win for Solo. And it matters, you know. It means something. And uh, I, I appreciate, like, John Cena is an interesting cat when it comes to the Anawai. He has wrestled every one of them. I think except Rosie that has been on the roster, I think. He wrestled Rikishi. He wrestled The Rock. He wrestled the Usos before. He's wrestled Roman. Now he's wrestled Solo. I mean, he's wrestled Solo, Solo's daddy, and Solo's brothers. <laughs> you know, like, it's like, it's amazing the kind of um, relationship that these guys have. And very, and they, the, the, the Samoans really give Cena a good match. You know, they're very aggressive. Cena can match it. They're bigger. Cena can, you know, overpower them usually. And it's always a really good match with you know, Samoans versus John Cena. Um, a lot of people talked about John Cena being very unselfish in terms of, you know, hey, it was time for him to go. You know, he's not going to. I would have preferred for Cena to go out on top, at least in this run, because I thought there was probably going to be another one. But if there ain't going to be another one, then I don't know. Maybe you did the right thing by having Cena lose. Um, very, it is very unselfish of John, but I think he's at that point in his career where this shit don't matter anymore. You know, um, it's, he's got other things to worry about, which takes us to our first note of the day that apparently John Cena got permission from SAG to work WWE during the strike. Uh, for starters, before we even get into that, imagine you have to get permission from a union to go work somewhere else. The union does not provide you really with anything. They don't pay the bills. All right. They don't. The union doesn't provide you with a job. You saying contractually that you will not wrestle because if you get injured, then the people who actually pay you being the, the, you know, the movie house, they can't produce the movie. If you're injured, that's one thing. Sag, who cares about that? What the hell do they do? They don't do anything. Well, they represent us. You can represent yourself. Negotiate your own contract. That's not going into that. But apparently John Cena got specially, legally written permission from SAG so that everybody can cop, stop calling him a, a union buster or he's trying to avoid the union and all this kind of stuff. Nah, they knew he was doing this and it wasn't like they could stop him, really. <laughs> and they really couldn't stop him, but I'm just floored that people choose to live that way. Um, but he's uh he he got he got permission. Everybody, sorry, you don't want to offend anybody in your beloved union. John Cena got permission to work a wrestling match. So now the union, I, I don't know if the kind the, the strike is over yet. I don't know, but we've pretty much seen the end of John Cena for now. Which is very unfortunate, you know, very unfortunate. The Miz, <clears throat> he comes out, and I was surprised to see him, and he brought out some guy named Ibrahim Al Hajj, Hajjaj, whatever, some kind of Saudi movie star, and he was going to do a move a Miz TV segment. It was completely interrupted by Grayson Waller, who then commanded that <laughs> this show be converted to the Grayson Waller effect. To which the Miz got upset that people actually was listening to Grayson Waller and taking down his set and putting up the set for Grayson Waller. So Miz called Grayson Waller cheap. Grayson Waller cut some stuff on the Miz, called him old, you know, old and told him to get out of the way. Um, Hodge then actually said something funny by saying that there's enough of him to do both shows. But when asked, he said he thinks that the Miz has the best show. Grayson Waller gives him another chance. He goes again and says he thinks that the Miz has the best show. Uh, again, Grayson Waller says that Hodge is disrespectful. He's been disrespectful, so he ha he's got to go. Uh, Hodge was then, I guess he was trying to take off his dishdashta, whatever they call it, the shirt. He's trying to take it off. And uh, <laughs> and Grayson Waller kicked him in the nuts, or he kicked him in the stomach. I think it might have been the stomach. And he looked like he was going to assault him. Then Miz saved this uh, Ibrahim Al-Hajjaj guy 
and ruined the Grayson Waller effect, and then Hajaj and the Miz beat up Grayson Waller. The crowd ate this thing up. It was tons of fun. I don't have no idea who this Hajaj guy is, but I'm not mad that they did something for the local audience. They always do something locally for uh, the, the the Saudi shows. Um, on SmackDown, uh, Grayson Waller was on commentary while Austin Theories lost to the Miz. A uh, clean loss, too. And a lot of people are starting really to sour on Austin Theory. And uh, I, I got to tell you, the promo he cut on that show was not good. It was not very good, if we're being honest. It just seemed like buzzwords that he was told to say. And that's it's been like this since Triple H took over. Whatever swag or intrigue or interest that Austin Theory had when Vince was in control, it's gone now. Any character or or anything's been sucked right out of him, you know. And I'm pretty sure it wasn't by the baddies. It was by Triple H trying to force him to conform to whatever his idea of what Austin Theory should be. It's been a disaster for the last two years. This Austin Theory thing has been an absolute mistake for the last two years. And uh, he just stood there talking about, I don't have a punchable face. I have a confident face. I was like, oh, no. Oh, no. This is not good. This is one of the least good promos Austin Theory's ever cut. I'm pretty sure it's not his fault. It's a mixture of the material and him, his character not having any direction. So, so many people are now doing something similar to Austin Theory, like Logan Paul, like Grayson Waller, and they're doing it better than him. But that's because everybody's, it's like, it's like Mark Wahlberg, you know? He's a peacock. You got to let him fly. You got to let him do his thing. Whatever Vince had for him, we should have just gone with that, you know? But we're we going to force him into this box. Whatever this fucking box is, we're going to force him into it. And he's got to do things this way. It's not working. This guy is 25, 26 years old. There's no reason why he went from interacting with Stone Cold Steve Austin and, and you know um, Vince McMahon and Pat McAfee and having championships and winning money in the bank to now he can't beat... Tubbo Owens. I mean, I'm sorry, ball and chain Owens, who apparently bust down walls or whatever due to his grab. Like, get the hell out of here with this guy. I'm getting actively aggravated by Kevin Owens' existence. But it's very unfortunate what they're doing to Grayson Waller and Austin Theory. But Grayson Waller at least can talk and get himself back over. So it's not that big of a deal. It's not, you know, hurting him in the least bit. He's just in the Miz position, which, you know, I don't know why we need so many people in the Miz position, but he's in the Miz position, you know. Next, Logan Paul versus Rey Mysterio for the U.S. title. So he did the weigh-in, and the weigh-in was kind of mid. I don't know why we needed to do this. Uh, Nick Aldis was there. He wanted no contact between these two gentlemen, and Rey still smacked Logan Paul. Then, you know, the, a scuffle broke out and Rey Mysterio hit Logan Paul in the head with the microphone, which um, everybody is saying, well, this is just a, a version of what they did with the Dylan Dennis, Logan Paul thing. They just wanted to do a WWE version of it. I wish they didn't. Look, the, the way in is fine. Look, we already know that Logan Paul is much bigger and weighs a lot more than Rey Mysterio. We already knew that. Come on. We didn't need this. We could have done this in the ring. We didn't need to go to a special location for all this and stuff. Like, I don't, I don't get it. The match itself was pretty good. Crowd, not all the way there. I think they were... The crowd was, again, heavily damaged by the Cena outcome. People were very disappointed in Cena losing. This match was a well-worked match. Not the best Logan Paul match, but pretty good. Rey Mysterio got saved. He almost fell on his head. Logan Paul, thankfully, was right there to catch him. Uh, the big storyline is one of Logan Paul's gophers decided to slide some brass knuckles to Logan Paul. Um, Santos Escobar caught the gopher, chased him away. Uh, um, well, Logan Paul dropped the brass knuckles outside the ring. So then the gopher tries to go back 
and get the brass knuckles for Logan Paul, only to run into Santos Escobar. Santos Escobar retrieves the brass knuckles, and then he puts the brass knuckles on the ring apron. Then he chases the gopher away. But leaving the brass knuckles on the ring apron brought the brass knuckles closer to Logan Paul. So now Logan Paul gets the brass knuckles, but he's in a perfect position for the 619. Logan Paul sells the 619. Ray jumps over, I guess, to do a splash or something. He gets punched in the face with the brass knuckles. One, two, three. Logan Paul is the United States champion. Absolutely the right decision. Absolutely the right decision. After the match, Logan Paul goes over to Ray, apologizes, says, hey, I just did what I had to do. Says he loves Ray. Ray says, you know what you did. You know what you did. And then Logan Paul's like, I won fair and square. <laughs> I won fair and square. Um, okay. After the match, Logan Paul talked about um, being a kid from Cleveland, that he's earned everything. He earned this championship. He also said he might be on Raw with the title, and he's going to be making a lot of surprise appearances. So I, I guess everybody is not correct, and he's just going to take the belt and disappear. He plans to be doing stuff with this belt, so hopefully that works out fine. This uh, seems to be more seeds for the breakup of the LWO. I wonder if Ray is going to blame Santos Escobar for putting the brass knuckles closer to Logan Paul. Is somebody else going to mention that Santos Escobar made that mistake? Was it a mistake at all? Maybe he did that on purpose. Maybe Santos Escobar is an, an, an undercover fan of Logan Paul. Maybe he's drinking prime in his off time. Who knows? But they haven't forgotten the story. Uh, knowing that Santos Escobar has a beef against Ray, this is something that you could play off of. It's an opportunity for you to have some fun with these characters and tell a, a well layered story. But Logan Paul needed that belt. The belt needed Logan Paul. Ray didn't need it. Escobar and Ray now have their story furthered even more. Let's see what comes out of that. But, you know, something better come out of it. I can tell you that. But they've been slow rolling this LWO uh, thing. They've been slow rolling the breakups of these groups. My God. Every group is slowly but surely breaking up. And it's taking literally forever for it to happen. Speaking of which, next is damage control. Bianca Belair loses to EO Sky. On SmackDown, Bianca said that this match was personal. And she wanted vengeance. She wanted to get that lick back. Then she was attacked by damage control. There was a fight and everybody needed to be separated. But in that fight, damage control essentially beat the shit out of Bianca Belair. Afterwards, Bailey said that Bianca needs to keep her head on a swivel. They keep beating her up and keep beating her up. But they're going to take her out for good. And then Bailey said, maybe I'll replace her at Crown Jewel once we take her out for good tonight. And then EO was like, whoa. And then Bailey was like, it's just a joke. I was kidding. I was kidding. Nick Aldis then appeared and says, well, I'm glad you, you know, think this is a joke in a game. He then banned damage control from ringside, which praise God that he thought about that and did it. Too bad he didn't do it two nights in a row. Uh, Bailey versus Bianca Belair was a solid match on SmackDown. Um, Bianca just basically beat the tar out of Bailey. KOD, uh, then she KOD Bailey through the table, which seemed like a perfect idea to write Bailey off that now she has to convalesce and she would not be in Saudi Arabia. However, she popped up at about the midpoint of this match. Um, so Bianca Belair cut a promo again in which she said she was training and taking care of herself while damage control was laughing and joking and she's going to get the title back um at a certain point in the match uh bailey popped up at ringside eo was like what are you doing here and bailey was like trust me you know i got your back trust me so she's distracting the referee she's getting involved uh bianca belair is taking cheap shots on bailey she's beating bailey up and then out of nowhere Kyrie sane assaults bianca from the crowd she got no reaction at least at first, because nobody knew who the hell that was. And it wasn't until the cameras got closer up on her that everybody realized it was Kyrie. Kyrie smashes Bianca Belair against the ring post. So Bianca is down. She's down for an eight count before she jumps in the ring 
to keep from being counted out. And as she does that, she gets hit with EO Sky's Moon Salt. One, two, three. EO Sky wins. Now, I'm about to about to complain about something. And it's not that Bianca lost. This whoever created this indie shit where you are outside the ring for an eight and then you jump in the ring at nine and then you catch a finisher and get pinned, you're a fucking retard. All right. Just take the count out at that point. They have overused this so much. I am so fucking sick of that. I'm going to save myself by sliding in the ring only to catch a claymore or a spear or a leg drop or whatever and get pinned. That's stupid. If you're going to stay outside the ring that long, it's the same idea as the the double finishers, the you know, the King's Road garbage that they doing earlier in the they did earlier in the show with the pedigree. Like if he's down already, pin him. He's down already. Like if she's already down, let her get counted out. Like what's the point of that last gasp? Only for it to immediately get snuffed out. What is the point of that, really? If there is no benefit to this. And this match could have benefited from EO winning by count out. Due to, you know, interference outside the ring that nobody saw. It would have kept Bianca alive. It would have kept the storyline alive. And we could have, you know, done more with these two. But now it's, it's pretty much over. Like, what can you do with Bianca now? She just got pinned by EO again. And you could say, oh, it was outside interference. So fucking what? She tried, She could still fight because she got from outside the ring, inside the ring. If she got hit by the metal ring post and then didn't get back in, she can say, I directly lost because Kyrie interfered. Rather than getting off your ass, getting back in the ring, and then well, I'm in a vulnerable position. Just take the count out loss. A count out loss is better than a pinfall loss. All right. That's dumb. And it's, it makes the baby face look dumb because it's almost always happening to the baby face. It makes them look stupid. Just take the count out loss. All right. It's, it's dumb. Just take the count out. Um, now the interesting bit here is that Bailey did not apparently know about this Kyrie thing. So she's laying on her butt and what an ample butt it is. My goodness, you see Bailey in them? Ooh, some silver pants. Sheesh. Anyway, Bailey is, uh, she's laying on her fat butt, and she's looking up, and she's surprised to see Kyrie. And Kyrie and EO are stomping on Bianca, and nobody's coming. Nobody's doing anything. And they are hugging, and they're best friends. And Bailey's like, what, Nani? <laughs> and then the, the commentators tell the story that the last time Kyrie was in WWE, last time she was seen, she was attacked by Bailey. And she was viciously attacked by Bailey and sent away for a year and a half or two years or however long it's been. So Bailey is directly tied into this story now. And it seems like EO is friends with somebody who might want some revenge on Bailey. So Kyrie Sane is brought back as a heel. That's fine. She's brought back as a partner to EO. That is also fine. I don't mind that. Bailey is seems to be the, the odd person out in this situation. I like that too, because now you see EO is making her own moves. She's bringing in people that she can trust because Bailey is being sneaky as usual. She keeps trying to subtly challenge EO and there's a lot of tension between Bailey and EO. And now there's going to be even more tension there because Kyrie is there and Kyrie don't like Bailey. So that's good. This is actually good storytelling. It's taken forever, but I actually like this. Okay. Now there's other words on the internet that they're going to bring back Saray or Sari, however they say her name in Japan. The young Japanese girl that was Sailor Moon on NXT. Apparently she's going to be brought back as well. And she's probably going to join this stable. And they're probably going to have a trio of Japanese female wrestlers to replace damage control, they're going to create a stable of Japanese female wrestlers for EO. That's a better idea than damage control, if you're being honest. The problem with this is you have to you have to identify these three women. They have to be different, all right? Because they're not from the United States, you have to make something to make them look individual. Um, Asuka looks creative. She looks on like something different. 
Kyrie also looks a little bit something different with the with the um, the fox face paint, and it's a little bit different. We don't know how you know she's gonna portray her character, but she seems to be a little bit more mature, a little bit more dastardly now because she's obviously as a heel, and uh, we need to do a little bit more with EO because she's been smothered in damage control for two or three years. But I like the idea. I don't hate it, and it follows. The, the rule of three when it comes to witches with the maiden, the mother, and the crone. Where you have Kyrie, who is the older one, even though she's a little young to be the, the crone, she's only two years older than Eo, but she's the more experienced wrestler. She's been in WWE before. She knows the games. She has more wisdom, I guess you could say. And then you have Eo, who's the mother. She's the woman in her prime. She's the one who is going to be sort of the mentor to Saray. Saray is probably going to be the younger one, naive. She's probably going to take all the bumps. If she's brought back, of course. I'm just all this assuming that Saray is going to be brought back. And she's probably going to be the one to take all the bumps. And she's going to be the more innocent one. The one who's going to groom and bring her up. Because she's very young. She's like 22 or something like that. She's very young. Um, so if they do that, that could be a good idea. The issue, of course, will be promos because none of them speak really good English. But they don't need to speak great English because they're starting to establish that they can do these promos backstage with subtitles. And since they're going to do that now, promos are not really going to be a problem anymore. You can just do vignettes. So if they do that trio, I'm actually, I don't actually have a problem with it. I know um, there's a lot of the people <laughs> in the Joshi community that are have steam coming out of their ears, especially not just because everybody knew Kyrie was coming back. So that wasn't really that big of a deal. It's just the right thing. that have got their steam coming out of their ears. Cause she just left. She left like earlier this year or late last year. She hasn't been gone that long, apparently. And, um, they're very mad about the sailor moon gimmick, which they say is a stereotype. There's no gimmick in which they can say it's not a stereotype. I don't know how many times I've seen Japanese culture or Japanese anime, manga, comic books, or whatever that have the kitsune in it, the fox demon, which is the same character that Kyrie apparently is going to play because she has fox demon makeup on. Uh, that's stereotypical as well. But I guess you're not allowed to say that because how many people know about the fox demons? You have to already be like this uh, into the Japanese culture already. But the Japanese schoolgirl is the only thing Americans know. So they look at it and be like, oh, uh, the, the magical girl. That's a stereotype. It's like, well, so is the fox demon. I've seen that fucking fox demon and everything. You know, it's in Naruto. It's in this, uh, the Sacred Blades, which was, is a comic that, I'm, uh, that I've been reading. It's literally in Japanese mythology. It's one of the most commonly occurring themes in Japanese mythology. It might as well be a stereotype. But the fox demon is very interesting because it's basically the god of trickery, which uh, which works for somebody Kyrie's size. And to be quite honest, that would be my only concern in terms of, you know, this stable is that none of the three of these women have any size or any body weight whatsoever. And you would think somebody like Rhea Ripley or Charlotte or Bianca would just dribble them all over the place because they're so goddamn tiny. But the three of them together could be very interesting. And also, if I remember correctly, EO did a, what was that, a triad type of gimmick in uh, Lucha Underground, where I think it was her and two other Japanese girls. Um, so it, there's some possibilities here that you could do that could be fun, that could take Kyrie and EO in a darker place and do something different. And uh, it's better than damage control, because damage control was, was no good. So I'm optimistic. You know, I'm optimistic even if Saray doesn't come back. I just like the idea of EO and, and Kyrie being together. I like that idea. I like the idea of us hurrying up the breakup of damage control. We need to sp sp hurry up with that, please. <laughs> I would like for you to do that a little bit quicker. Damian Priest wrestled Cody Rose. This was the only other match in the lower half of the show before the main event that the crowd really got into because people really like Cody. But this was basically a Raw main event. This was every Raw match for like the last four months. Damian Priest is doing a really good job against Cody. They're doing dueling finishing moves where the reckoning and the crossroads and the reckoning and the crossroads. And okay, sure. 
Then uh, Damian Priest hits South of Heaven, which I guess is his new finisher, and Cody kicked out, which, you know, hey, fuck your new finisher and your old one. <laughs> I guess. As usual, however, uh, Judgment Day made a bunch of run-ins. Um, J.D. McDonough and Finn Balor came out there. Jay Uso got a huge reaction when he took out Dominic and J.D. McDonough and uh, Finn Balor, which he got a huge reaction for taking out Dominic. I mean, Dominic gets heat everywhere he goes. So <laughs> what I loved about this part specifically is how Finn Balor kept waving like, come on, come on. And it took forever for Dominic to get out there. But when he did, the booze was just like immediate. <laughs> like, Ooh. And then he got down the ramp and then Jay came out of nowhere and kicked his shit in. That was great. Big pop. Uh, Cody Rhodes wins with a triplicate of crossroads. He also stole Will Ospreay's giant cutter move. Okay. Uh, it, sol it was solid. It wasn't terrible. It wasn't bad. So it is what it is. All right. Before we get to the main event, let's knock out some of the other stuff that happened on SmackDown that, you know, was not tied into um, the rest of the uh, crown jewel. Chelsea Green and Piper Niven were defeated by Shotzi and Charlotte Flair. So if you thought they cared about those women tag team title, they they don't. Apparently, there was supposed to be a, a Karrion Cross uh, segment that from that was on SmackDown that ended up getting nixed, so it didn't happen. Also, it was supposed to be something with Scarlet too, but they ended up getting rid of that too. Um, very unfortunate. So I was told that Shotzi's partner was Mia Yim. And that's what I thought it was going to be. And if it was me and him, I probably would be feel better about this. Cause at least it'd have been somebody other than fucking Charlotte. Like what does Charlotte and shots? He really got in common anyway. Nothing. Why is Charlotte in this position? Why is Charlotte here? Like she, she has to be involved with any and every championship. This definitely should. I, I, look at, I, I say it. I'm not a big fan of me and him. I'm not. But this definitely should have been her spot. You know, Shotzi and Mia Yim makes more sense. Charlotte comes in, beats Chelsea Green or Piper Never, whichever one of them she beats. And now she's in a position to be a tag team champion. This is stupid. I hate this. It's good for Shotzi because at least Shotzi's going to be on TV. But generally speaking, I hate this. Hate it. Uh, a Donnie Brook took place between the Brawl and Brutes and Pretty Deadly, kind of botchy. The Pretty Deadly won the match. What is the point of the Brawl and Brutes having their own match type if they're just going to lose? And where the hell is Sheamus? Did Sheamus get hurt? Because uh, she hasn't been doing anything. They slowly but surely are probably going to end up breaking the Brawl and Brutes up and uh, turning Butch back into Pete Dunne, which ain't going to do him any favors, but at the very least, it's going to be something that Triple H is going to cream his pants over because you know how much he likes doing that you know trying to play booker of the year to the dorks on the internet uh another piece of business is the most interesting piece of business to me and that is b fab wanting to do business with bobby lashley so lashley had met up with logan paul they dapped up and uh, he gave the street profits some credit and then as he was walking away, Lashley says that that's the kind of guy everybody we need to be. He sees something he wants, he goes and he takes it. <clears throat> and that's when B-Fab showed up and said that the Street Province is looking good, Lashley is looking good, and she wants to have a word. And I just thought about that and I said, I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued. Let's see what she can do, you know. I'm not even thinking about a Shanti D. Adonis joining that group. I'm not even thinking about that. I'm thinking about B-Fab joining that group. Now, here's what I need from them, though. She needs to get those 1996 braids out of her head. I hate those braids. I hate those hood rat braids. I cannot stand them. I know they make her they make her look different because nobody else on the roster has them. But I hate those fucking braids. I really do. Um, They got to go. <laughs> that, that poetic justice... Uh, Friday, bye Felicia shit. She got tied up in her head. I hate those things. But I'm interested in seeing what she can do outside of B-Fab, you know? Because we tried B-Fab twice and it didn't work. Maybe we ought to take a different approach to it. What does her name, Brianna? 
Nobody else on the roster is named Brianna. Just just change her name to Brianna. Brianna something, whatever. And change her change you could change up her look a little bit. I don't know if you want to get rid of the braids completely. I would get rid of them personally. But if, if she wants to keep them, whatever. She can wear like a business suit or whatever. And she might be able to do something there. And then it's a new face for the women's division. Now she was absolutely god awful as a wrestler. She was one of the worst wrestlers I've ever seen. What what bar none. <laughs> one of the worst. But then again, she was put in the ring to wrestle and she hadn't had a lot of time. That's just being fair. And this was when she wrestled on NXT. She wrestled Alex uh, I'm sorry, Electra Lopez. It was one of the worst matches ever perpetrated among the American public. But there were two women who didn't have a lot of experience. And this was NXT 2.0 where they were both strong characters and their factions were feuding. So people felt like it was going to be okay. It was going to work out. Then it turns out that it wasn't going to be okay. And it wasn't going to work out. And it was going to look bad. It was going to make everybody feel bad. And, you know, that's why Electra Lopez is stuck in NXT now. But since... B Fab could she was important to hit row. She got called up when they got called up. And I think she was she was the one who was signed to a record contract or something like that. <clears throat> she had like some kind of background in, in rap music or something. And uh that's why she she didn't when she she got fired first. When they got fired the first time, they got rid of her first because she was they was like this group is terrible and this girl can't wrestle, she's gotta go. But I'm a big fan of repurposing her because we've seen B-Fab. B-Fab sucks. Let's try something else. You know, don't be in a rush. Let's see what else she can do first. And I've watched more than enough wrestling. I've seen plenty of guys get repurposed. You know, a new look, new music, new approach. Who knows what might happen? I, I've seen Stevie Richards and Daisy Dukes. I've seen them wrestle in slacks. I've seen them wrestle in regular tights. <laughs> you know, you see people change. B Fab, she's somebody they brought in and uh, they have been training her. Let's see what she can do because she's been B Fab the entire time I've known her. I don't know what else she can be. So let's give that a try before we, you know, pitch her into the wind. Ashanti Theodonis, I like him too. If we could bring him along in the group, that would be great. If we can't, then guess what? Put him in a tag team with like Cedric Alexander or something. I don't know. He's good. You don't want to fire him. He's he's a good worker. But if he's not going to fit with whatever they're doing with Lashley and all of these guys, then just put him in a tag team and call it a day. You know, there's no need to be to go around firing folks when you can use them for other things. Now, let's get into that main event. But first, we got to go to SmackDown. LA Knight started the show, said it was going to be a hostile takeover. He's going to take over everything Roman stood for. Roman came out, said that he thought he was pretty clear in who the tribal chief was. And he went on sabbatical. And he expected a lot of things to change. He expected people to step up, but didn't expect it to be LA Knight. So then we get some really good digs here. Well, Roman says that, you know, I'm pushing the business forward. What what, this, what the kids say I'm doing? I'm making this business cinema. I, I, I didn't turn this business into a billion dollar industry. You setting us back. What, what are you doing? What are you doing? You're a cosplay redneck version of my cousin. We gonna beat you and leave you out in the desert. And I, I was like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> Roman finally showed up for this damn thing. You know, you feel me? After this promo, I was like, yeah, Roman finally showed up. He'd been chilling, you know, letting LA Knight get over. He came in and, you know, he didn't quite flatten him because it's not anything that LA Knight hasn't already heard. It's not anything he had, that hadn't already been said to him. But Roman Reigns showing the difference that he's doing something new while L.A. Knight's doing something you've already seen before. And then L.A. Knight response was better than I thought it would be. Where he talked about Roman being champion for 1,200 days, and he beat everybody that has come across him. 
But he says he ain't coming from the same angle as everybody else. He ain't not here to finish something. He's here to start something. I was like, yeah, this guy's good. And then he says that, uh, you look at you, you're damn near a megastar. And that's only because you carry that title. But me, I'm a megastar because I live it every goddamn day. And I was like, yeah, buddy. I don't know what that means, but I like it. <laughs> I don't know what it means, but it sounds cool. I guess it means that he drives fast cars and, you know, lives a megastar lifestyle. I don't know. But it sounds good. It sounds great. And um, they they had words and people, they needed to be separated. So no fisticuffs occurred between the two of them. Paul Heyman later says that uh, he suggests that Nick Aldis have security and medical teams and stuff prepared for Saudi Arabia because this is the most savage Roman Reigns has ever been. I don't see how that could be. This is the same Roman Reigns match we've seen four times already. Four to five times already. Now, the match was good. All right. Uh, finish was pretty, very predictable. Very, very predictable. Crowd was hot for LA Knight. They were chanting for LA Knight throughout the entire match. They had signs for LA Knight. At one point, there was a little bit of down time and there was some a smattering of CM Punk chants, which I thought I was hearing things when I heard that. And I was thinking, why the hell are they chanting for CM Punk? Like, that, they wouldn't be, would they? And I thought maybe they were chanting something in their native language, you know, Arabic. And then I thought maybe I heard an asshole chant. But I, I'm pretty sure CM Punk was in that chant somewhere because other people heard it too. And um, I, I was like, oh boy, we got to start that again. Anyway, there was a lot of signs for LA Knight. Very, very, very behind him were the crowd. Of course, Jimmy and Solo got involved, which, you know, it is what it is on that tip. I, I'm very disappointed that WWE cannot think of anything better than we're just going to have guys with 100 run-ins. Look, it's okay, you know, but this NWO, it's happening on both shows. That's really what's pissing me off because it's so much of it. It's too much. It's the damage control. It's, it's like having many NWOs all over the show. You know, it's like it was too much in 96 and 97 where every Hulk Hogan match had a run in. Every NWO match had 32 run ins. You know, it's the attitude era all over again. We're just going to do 100 run ins. Everybody's coming and going. And it's like there's chaos. All right. It's it's a distraction. Um, But. Of course, they had Jimmy and Solo. Roman gets hit with the BFT, which is LA Knight's finisher. Uh, uh, honestly, very s- smart booking here by not having Roman kick out of LA Knight's finish. It kept LA Knight strong. Instead, Jimmy Uso put Roman's foot on the bottom rope. This is what led LA Knight to finally had enough of Jimmy go out there and beat his ass, dribbled him all across the announce desk. Then Roman came out there to help Jimmy. Same thing happened to him. He gets dribbled on the announce desk. And then as they're out doing outside the ring shenanigans, which seemed like they were out there forever again, uh, Roman spears LA Knight through the barricade. LA Knight then, then throw him back into the ring where he takes another spear. One, two, three. Roman Reigns wins. Uh, okay. Uh, There's another flat finish because you killed him with the spear outside the ring just to throw him back in the ring and hit the spear again. But. Again, I, I'm. Uh, I, I, what can I say? When you do multiple, this is what producers and agents are for: is to protect the finishes of the main event. If you were going to do the uh, fake outside the ring stuff, you know, babyface gets back in the ring, gets hits with another move. You don't let it do it earlier in the match and earlier in the night. If you're going to do a hundred distractions, it shouldn't be a bunch of matches on the show with a bunch of distractions. You know, you keep it special. You know, and and again, you have these people who apparently are smart enough because Nick Aldis did it before when he banned damage control from ringside. Yet he didn't ban damage control again on at Crown Jewel when it would have made sense for him to ban damage control because that's an actual title match. And then he bit, didn't ban the bloodline in the Crown Jewel main event. What, what the fuck? Why introduce that Nick Aldis is smart enough to ban people from interfering in these matches? Only to let people interfere in the matches when they actually matter. 
I don't know. Look, I'm not a huge fan of baby faces losing clean. I'm not saying these guys should lose clean. I'm saying that they should cheat in other ways. It is a complete and total lack of creativity that every fucking match has a hundred run-ins. This guy's got the ref. Like, you can do that every once in a while. All right? But when every match is chaos, then it's all the same. That's what makes these matches boring. All of these matches have run-ins in them. Like, what the hell? There's nothing left for the top guys to do. Roman should not, his Roman's match did not need a run-in. It needed Roman to cheat, but it doesn't need a he doesn't need people to run in. All right, he's got a hundred ways of cheating. Roman has a thing where he kicks out and he you know thrust them in the nuts. He did it to Jay Uso. I'm not sure if he did it to anybody else, but it's a it's a good way of doing it. He could have hit LA Knight in the nuts. And then while LA Knights was grabbing his cross, he could have put him in the guillotine choke and then just choked him out and then that was it. It would have been fine, you know. Roman would have looked strong. Um, it would have been an excuse for LA Knight because he got hit in the nuts. But it would all have been fine and this would have stood out. Look at how many matches on this show had run-ins. Pretty much the entire second half of the card had run-ins. The entire second half of the card had run-ins in it in every goddamn match. Logan Paul match had a run-in because his guy shows up with the brass knuckles. Damian Priest and Cody Rhodes had Judgment Day run-ins. You had Bianca and uh, Io had Damage Control and Kyrie Sane run-ins. And in the main event, had, you know, fucking Jimmy Uso and Solo Sokoa run-ins. This match, this show had seven Matches on the card, four of them had run-ins. Go back and listen to what people said about Vince Russo and how he booked these shows and he had obsessive amounts of run-ins and disqualifications. It, it's stupid, all right? Stop doing this. It's excessive. And I know it comes with having all of these factions, but it's getting excessive. Every fucking match with a title on the line features 400 other people. It's ridiculous. Eventually, somebody's got to smarten up and say, if this show had any logic to it, would have to say that everybody's banned from fucking ringside. How can AEW get it right? And then WWE can't get it right. If it was just Judgment Day, it would still be too much because they're doing it every week. If it was just the bloodline, they've been doing it for three years already and nobody smartened up. Come on, bro. Like that's, it's incredibly frustrating. This is what's making Roman's story and the bloodline story drag on forever and making people hate it because they're seeing the same shit over and over and over and over and over. Various bloodline members coming down to ringside, distracting the referee, attacking people, putting feet on the ropes, all kinds of stuff. This shit should be expected every match now. An intelligent person expects this every single match. Why are the general managers and the referees not stopping it? You burying in these people at this point. You got to stop doing this. You got to stop. It's boring and it's ruining what should be interesting stuff. You know, if the only match on this show that had a run in was Kyrie Sane's debut or re debut, it would stand out a lot more. But it wasn't, it was another run in in the sea of fucking run ins. Most of these matches didn't need run ins at all. Now, Logan Paul needs, again, Logan Paul needed to cheat. But Having a run in is a cheap way of doing of, of doing it because you're doing it in every match. Every match is supposed to have a heel doing something creative, but illegal. I mean, what happened to good old fashioned eye rakes? Pulling the pulling the tights. Even I would have taken something cliche like snatching uh, Rey Mysterio's mask. Something, anything outside of oh, here's another person that shouldn't be out there sliding weapons in like he didn't have a manager so why is this guy out here you know if Logan Paul would have just had 
Like good old fashioned heels would have just had brass knuckles in his tights. He'd have had them in his boots, you know, or something like that. And we didn't need this guy. This is what I mean. Like there's so much creativity being lost in these, whoever is doing the creative, just being lazy. And I spend a lot of time on this because I really want to impress this upon people that this is why the ratings and shit are plummeting. You tell people a match is going to happen and they already know because they've been taught for the last six goddamn months somebody's going to run in. People said the same thing about the Roman match. They already knew it. They already knew, oh, the bloodline's going to run in. And, and, and instead of surprising them by not having the bloodline run in, they did exactly what everybody thought was going to happen. They had a slow-paced match, still pretty good with some good intensity. Guys you know, engaged the crowd. Good psychological, slow-paced match. But there's going to be bloodline run-ins. We didn't need that. Roman can cheat on his own. And if he can't cheat, if he wants to win clean, fine. At this point, if Roman wants to win clean, who's going to complain? It's, it's better for him to cheat, but the run-ins have got to stop. This is getting on my nerves. I'm tired of watching WWE shows, and they're full of fucking run-ins. It's so it's so boring. It's ruining what could be a solid storyline or a solid show. You don't need to do that in order to get heat. If you can't figure out another way to get heat, then you're not trying hard enough. All right. All in all. Let's let's get to the end of this. SmackDown was dreadful. Um, outside of the, the LA Knight and Roman story and the story between Cena and Solo, you could have skipped SmackDown and you wouldn't have missed anything. It was taped. Who cares? Crown Jewel, however, was, was a good show, but the early part of the show, I think, had a detrimental effect on the late, later part of the show. Everything before Miz TV had a detrimental effect on everything after Miz TV. Uh, uh, Seth Rollins and Drew had no heat. And then once they took the, the title out of the picture, now Damian Priest versus Cody Rhodes literally has nothing because now the briefcase is, is not in play anymore. People thought maybe they would put on Damian Priest and Cody first and then Cody would win, but Damian Priest might cash in the money in the bank later. But then by having Seth Rollins go on first, okay, well, now that belt's gone. All right? And now what, Damian Priest is not going to cash in on Roman, so you can forget it. But that match had no heat because there was no heel. The second match on the show was a five-way in which four of the women aren't even over. The third match featured John Cena, which was excellent. And Cena lost, which was heartbreaking. But that was part of the problem is that you broke everybody's heart in the third match. And now you've got four other matches on the show. They tried to bring everybody up with the local comedian, movie star, or whatever. And that worked for a little bit. But then as soon as people got back in the ring, it kind of came down. So Logan Paul and, and, and Rey Mysterio, who had a good match, they didn't get the reaction that they should have gotten because people are just kind of like, eh, I'm bummed out about John Cena. The next match, girls. So that tell you right there, Things are not going to work out that well because it's a women's match. Bianca hasn't been on TV that often. Um, there's heat here, but then they did the run-ins and all that kind of stuff too, which was, a, again, a distraction and took away from the women's match. The next thing was Cody and Damian Priest. Cody was strong enough to get the fans back into it. Same you could say for Roman and uh, LA Knight. But again, tons of run-ins. Now, the difference being is that Cody overcame all the run-ins because he's Superman, you know, and LA Knight couldn't because he's not Superman. I think if you look at, you know, Cody and Damian Priest probably should not have made the card because it's a Raw main event. And that probably would have shortened the show and probably saved some of the energy. But other than that, I think every other match on the show was probably pay-per-view worthy. And uh, I think the show was a success. It was a solid show, but it wasn't anything exciting. Nothing new came out of this show except for Kyrie's three debut. All right, so I'm going to close on a note that uh, was not mentioned yet. But apparently the reason why Gunter has not 
on uh, the show has to do with his residency issues in the United States and he will not be able to perform overseas for six months. I don't know when the government had the power to ban you from performing overseas for six months, but apparently Florida can do that. And uh, so he's not going to be able to perform in Saudi Arabia. He also probably will also not make it to Elimination Chamber, which is going to be in in Australia. Um, That sucks. You know, I want to know what the the intricacies of that are. And maybe if I was better at this whole YouTube thing, I would look into it. But I don't think it's important enough for me to do so. So I'm not going to. And um, so I'm just going to look at that and say, kind of screwed up, bro. Maybe Triple H should step in and try to fix this and see what's going on. But uh, Gunter being left off the show sucks. That's that's no good. But at least we got Raw. At least he can perform in the United States and that ought to be okay. All right. Crown Jewel was okay. SmackDown was skippable. Let me know what you guys think. And I'll talk to you guys later. If you got this far, give me a like, give me a share and subscribe. Thank you.